I think we're a long way from considering whether uh, Ukraine would be part of NATO. We hope it can remain an independent country, a sovereign country, and kick Russia out. Uh, so let's accomplish that first. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. This is where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. I'm Ian Bremmer. And on today's episode, my interview with Utah Senator Mitt Romney at his Washington office, though you won't see that. He'll talk about the latest in the congressional debt ceiling drama, as well as the biggest foreign policy challenges facing this country. During a presidential debate back in 2012, Barack Obama mocked then-candidate Romney for claiming that Russia was America's top geopolitical threat. In the 1980s or now, calling to ask for their foreign policy back because you know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. Suffice it to say, Romney may be entitled to more than a little smugness in that regard. I'll ask the senator who sits on the Foreign Relations Committee about the threat that Russia poses today, where China stacks up in the mix, and much more. Let's get to it. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. G Zero World would also like to share a message from our friends at Foreign Policy. Something's often missing in the way we talk about the climate crisis, and that's the issue of justice and equity. On season three of Heat of the Moment, a podcast from Foreign Policy in partnership with the Climate Investment Funds, host John D. Sutter explores the concept of a just transition away from fossil fuels and hopefully towards a net zero future. Listen to season three of Heat of the Moment, a just transition wherever you get your podcasts. Senator Mitt Romney, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Ian. Good to be with you. So um, we'll get to foreign policy, but I want to start with Washington. Um, after midterm elections, at least it feels to an outside observer like things might be a little less dysfunctional. Am I in any way right about that? Or given debt limit, given polarization, no, we should still be deeply concerned about the state of all affairs. Yeah, I think you're wrong. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, it's it's not uh, become more functional. I think it's probably become a little less functional, uh, in part because we have a majority of Republicans in the House, but a very narrow majority, which makes it very difficult for the Speaker to pull that group together. And how a Republican House is going to work with a Democrat Senate and a Democrat president is uh, is uncertain. Maybe I'll be wrong on this, but you know, in the last couple of years, we had a group of Republicans and Democrats in the Senate that worked together on a bipartisan basis for Electoral Count Act reform, for infrastructure, for background checks for guns, uh, for religious liberty and marriage. I mean, all these things were done on a bipartisan basis, the CHIPS Act, and, uh, and it passed in the Senate. When it passed in the Senate, went to the House, and Nancy Pelosi, who's known for being able to crack the whip, got her people to vote for it, and these things passed. Now. Uh, whether the Senate can come together is a good question. I presume it can, as it has in it's the It's more genteel here. You've got bigger offices. Well, well, well th this bipartisan group is used to coming together. But as it goes to the House, I think it's quite a question as to whether or not uh, the House Republicans would come together and, as a block, vote all together on something that was bipartisan through the Senate. Now, no one's expecting a lot of legislation to come out of a divided House and Senate. But on the debt limit, I mean, historically, when it gets towards crisis, everyone recognizes you can't default. You have to actually come together. We know that McCarthy and Biden are starting a process of meeting. It's going to, I'm sure, take a very long time. But are we right to not be panicked about that? Uh, I hope so. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not panicked, but I'm clear-eyed enough to know that we're in uncharted water, in part because there are some individuals who are saying they will not vote to increase the debt limit no matter what. It's like, well, that's, uh, that's an unusual stance to, to take because the debt limit being increased is required to pay Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and our hospitals and our schools and all the things that government pays for. We talk about it paying the interest on the debt. 
yes, that's really important, but it also pays all those other things. And therefore, not raising the debt limit would mean that the entire, if you will, economy of our country would be dramatically impacted almost immediately uh, and would have extraordinary negative consequence for the American people. So will we act? Yeah, probably, because we'll recognize that if we don't, we're going to get blamed. Uh, and the question will always be, who's going to be blamed, Republicans or Democrats? That will tell you who will cave. But, uh, but I, I hope instead of going through these kinds of uh, games of chicken, that we're able to have the White House and the House leadership work together and say, hey, let's take this opportunity to rein in our spending problem. I mean, don't the Republicans and Democrats understand that the reason that we continue to have these larger and larger deficits that are unfunded is because of decisions that they were both very happily complicit with? Yeah, but, but two-thirds of spending is automatic. That's part of our challenge. One-third we vote on, two-thirds we don't vote on. So the sense is, all right, we've got to come together in such a way that we don't keep on adding to the, to the debt. We're at $31 trillion in debt now. Uh, we have more debt uh, than the size of our total economy. And so we probably need to take some action to see if we can't slow down the growth in debt. Uh, hopefully the White House gets that and says, all right, we understand the American people voted for a Republican House. Uh, the Republican House wants to get in place a process that reigns in the excessive spending and slows down the growth in debt. It can't be draconian, but something's got to happen, as opposed to what we're seeing now, where the White House says, we're not going to, uh, do, we're not going to negotiate. Well, that, that's a missed opportunity for them and for us. Now, you represent Utah, so I, I don't want to ask if you were a betting man. But nonetheless, I want to say, you feel fairly strongly, though, at the end of the day, we're not going to see an actual default on obligations by the U.S. government. Yes, I'm, I'm quite confident that at the end of the day, we will not default. The question is, how close will we come? What political cost will there be? Uh, will McCarthy I, last? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, well, I think McCarthy will last, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I just, um, I, I think we get there uh, at the end of the day, but I don't know how um, frightening it'll get. I mean, it's like a game of chicken. Uh, and uh, what's the old story, which is the only uh, logical strategy in a game of chicken is to uh, uh, take your steering wheel out Throwing and wave out it out the, the window, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, either that or just drive off the road. And I'd like to see this resolved sooner rather than, you know, getting to a point where people are nervous. I want to ask you a little bit about all of this wokeism. There seems to be so many Republicans today that are running more heavily, whether it's Trump, whether it's Nikki Haley, whether it's Ron DeSantis, on big cultural issues, on critical race theory, on how we educate children in the schools. Is this a distraction? Is this a critical thing to push for the base, is this the way you want to see the Republican Party heading? Well, it, it works. Populism works. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you watch the news at, at night, why these little personal interest stories are always what gets the most attention. And the left is canceling and the right is canceling. I mean, that generates a lot of uh, anger, passion, uh, and gets people to the polls. And uh, by the way, it leads to contributions coming in in the mail. So uh, I think as you watch our politics today, more and more is focused on things that excite and anger uh, and less is focused on big issues like how are we going to deal with China as an emerging threat? Uh, how are we going to deal with artificial intelligence uh, and put guardrails around it somehow? How about social media? How are we going to find a way to keep it from affecting our kids? What are we going to really do on climate change that makes a difference not just to the, the local uh, uh, advocates in the U.S., but actually makes a difference globally. So I mean, what I'm hearing these from are you big is issues. you do not think that these culture war issues should be political priorities for the U.S. government. Well, they, they work for, for the politics. I understand that, but, but you don't think they should be policy priorities. Well, I, I think the American people want to make sure that they have a bright future for themselves and for their kids. That's what they want to see. They want to make sure that we're doing what's necessary to protect those things. And when we're not talking about the biggest challenges that we have, I think we're shortchanging the uh, the American people. I'm very happy to hear you with common sense on this issue. This is, <laughs> believe me, um, but of course, you know, this is PBS and there are a lot of places that, you know, the leads are a little bit louder. Um, but I want to ask a couple quick questions on the things that are much more important that you just brought up. So for example, social media, would you support a ban on social media for say, children under 16, under 14? Do you think that's a credible thing for America to do? Yeah, I wouldn't uh, be inclined to have a ban uh, against young people. I would want to educate parents uh, about what the impact is. But I also might want to say, look, uh, 
let's make sure that all the social media companies have a responsibility for at least one of their services to be populated only by human beings and to verify that a real human is behind who is posting information. So every account, for example, on Twitter or on Facebook would be a verified account. Well, they might have some that are not verified. That'd be one uh, service you could choose on Twitter. But the other service you could choose would say verified only. Uh, these are real people, and perhaps we don't know their name. It's perhaps it's a you know a hidden name, but but at least someone would know I, the name. I know some senators that have dabbled <laughs> in so, that. I still do. <laughs> Absolutely, Pierre Delecto <laughs> Absolutely. is not going away. Uh, but uh, but make sure that they're human beings as opposed to bots uh, and foreign entities that are trying to influence and create uh, anger here and resentment. Um, I, I do think that parents are increasingly aware that, uh, that having young people um, uh, on social media has the potential of, of uh, creating some real problems for their, for their young people. What's the legal obligation that a social media platform has to ensure that disinformation is not actively being promoted on their site? They don't have a legal obligation today. No, I know uh, that. And, I mean, that, they? Well, and, and the First Amendment allows them to do what they uh, what they feel is in their interest. Uh, same thing with a newspaper, TV, radio. They don't have to uh, make sure that everything said is, is truthful. The challenge is that in the TV and the radio, you have editors, and if they publish something which is, uh, which is untruthful, they may be liable for slander. Uh, and, um, and we don't have that with social media because we don't know who's posting. Uh, and there's no particular responsibility for the social media company to make sure that there is a real human behind it uh, and that there's someone responsible for what's being said. There are oftentimes no editors, no fact checkers. Uh, and uh, On some platforms, a lot fewer now than there were just a year ago. I'm afraid you're right. Uh, and, and one of the things, I mean, I, as a good conservative, I, I was so happy to see, you know, the New York Times in trouble and some of these other, you know, publications in trouble. And now it's like, oh, wait a second, maybe I should have rethought that. The agonizing reappraisal, those entities have fact checkers. They have editors. They're subject to libel and slander laws. And that actually helps protect our discourse. Social media does not have those things. And how to work them into social media is a real question we're facing. I don't have an answer to that. Citizen journalists and bots driving uh, information outcomes are not yeah, necessarily I, the answer. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as this continues to, to expand, the, the misinformation that's, uh, that's available on social media, I think people will, over time, gravitate towards more responsible uh, known sources of information, Maybe. and the, uh, so they'll they'll say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for the blue check marks, and and by the way, only if the blue check mark uh, has been act accurately uh, evaluated and is determined to be a human, as opposed to just anyone with eight bucks, yeah, can actually get yourself right. a blue check mark. Yeah, that's not a step forward in your view. No, that's probably a step backward because it gives the appearance of validity when it's not actually valid. Now, you also brought up uh, climate change. I, I want to ask you, uh, do you think the Inflation Reduction Act, misnamed as it is, um, is a step forward meaningfully for the United States to transition to clean energy? Well, let me step back and just point out that uh, something that we all know, which is it's global uh, climate change, not U.S. climate change, not and, there, yeah. and, and therefore those things which are massively expensive and disruptive in the U.S., but have no prospect of affecting global climate, in my opinion, are a mistake. So much of the act includes things like subsidies for people buying electric cars uh, in the U.S. Um, and you might think, well, that helps, except... Which Congress is going to spend a lot more money on than they thought they were going to. Yeah, about five times as much, yeah. all right? It's much, much more expensive. And the reality is uh, you can't get an electric car in many cases. You're backed up trying to get the batteries. Um, the, the raw materials for the batteries almost all come from China, either the raw materials or the processing of them from Chinese companies. Uh, and, and if magically every car in America were to disappear, and we all were on bikes, global emissions of CO2 keep going up. Well, why is that? Well, because China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, as they become more developed, they're using more and more energy. And so just fixing things here does not deal with the global challenge. So uh, the, the money being spent on things that are just, uh, just U.S., in my opinion, are a huge waste of money. And instead, we should take those dollars and invest in technology, new innovative technologies, which will be adopted here and adopted by other nations because they're low cost and low emitting. So part of what's in the Inflation Reduction Act is that kind of uh, technology, which is great. 
uh, small nuclear facilities, hydrogen technology, carbon capture, th those have promise. Um, some more than others, battery technologies, but, uh, but those things that are just making us feel good and appealing to uh, if environmental lobby uh, are, are things which frankly, in my opinion, turn off a lot of people on the right and create a credibility problem. Uh, when it comes to the uh, solutions that we need for climate change. The U.S. has a credibility problem with a lot of people at home in the U.S. The U.S. also has a credibility problem with a lot of people around the world. Uh, the U.S. is not the largest carbon emitter in the world today, that's China, but is responsible for the largest amount of carbon emitted historically, in other words, getting us to where we are today. Does that oblige, does that lead to a special responsibility for the United States to provide more resources for other countries around the world to help facilitate a transition? Yeah, not going to happen. Uh, what we are going to do is look forward and say what things are in the interest of, uh, of Americans uh, and the world. And it's in our interest to see our technologies being adopted around the world, low cost technology. So we will invest. We'll do the investments that uh, the brains of America have always provided for the world. We will make those investments. We'll help get them adopted around the world. That's the, the contribution we'll make. But just sending money to other nations and saying, oh, we're sorry, that's not in the cards. Yeah, I'm not talking about reparations. I'm more talking about to the extent that we have countries like India, which are going to be the largest emitter in the world. They have a nominal 27 net zero, 2070 net zero carbon plan. The world is gonna have a lot more emissions. Does the United, should the United States be helping a country like India make their obligations faster? Well, the best way to do that is by helping them get off of uh, burning uh, animal coal. feces, yeah, okay. coal, Absolutely. wood, uh, and using natural gas, which hopefully will come from Alaska and other places in the U.S., and helping them adopt nuclear technologies and other uh, sustainable technologies. That's the best way we can help uh, India and other nations. Okay, let's move to big foreign policy issues that you and I talk about a lot. Um, start with 10 years ago. Actually, it was 11 at this point. I remember a debate that you had with Barack Obama where you said that Russia was the biggest national security threat to the United States. And Obama uh, almost mocked that response. Um, do you feel like maybe he should be rethinking that these days? Well, my, my, uh, my comment was that Russia was the biggest geopolitical adversary. So not military adversary at that point, or even threat, but that they were a geopolitical adversary. No question about it. Every uh, initiative that we had at the UN, they would block. Uh, they supported the world's worst actors, and they were fighting against us, if you will, politically, geopolitically, uh, on every front. Uh, there's no question but that Vladimir Putin wants to reestablish what was once the Russian Empire, the old Soviet Union in one form or another, and, uh, and that he would be uh, uh, belligerent in doing so and, and malevolent in doing so, and he has been. Um, Madeleine Albright was kind enough to see me at an event and said, you were right, Mitt. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think there was a recognition, even in the Obama administration at that time that I was right, but in politics, you're looking for you know, wages. Did Obama ever come back to you privately and like, yeah, I was a little uh, uh, No, we haven't had that conversation. Never? We Never. haven't had that conversation. Well, there's no. still time. Yeah, exactly. Still time. Exactly. But look, we, we all recognize that Russia is a bad actor. Uh, and uh, at the same time, today, uh, looking long term, what's the greatest threat to our national security? Um, probably the emergence of China as a great power. Uh, we're not, they're not an adversary militarily today. Hopefully never will be. Hopefully we can get them to divert from a course of confrontation to one of um, competition and maybe collaboration on some fronts, but they're not there today. Now, to, on Russia specifically, yeah. we've just seen the United States along with many NATO allies now gonna be providing advanced tanks uh, to the Ukrainians. Literally 24 hours later, the President Zelensky is like, okay, but we'd like F-16s right now. Um, what sort of limits should there be uh, in terms of U.S. and NATO military support for the Ukrainians? Is this a slippery slope? Is this a boiling frog? Do you worry about that, or are you, very, are you really aligned with what the Americans are doing right now? Well, before I answer that, I just want to say, I, I think it's um, extraordinarily uh, ironic for the Russians to say this is an outrageous uh, you know, expansion uh, and escalation. It's like, well, Russia has hundreds of tanks in, right, in Ukraine, so they don't think the Ukrainians should have any tanks to respond. It's like, come on, they've, there are already tanks there, they're Russian tanks, and the Ukrainians should have the capacity to, to have themselves. tanks of their own, yeah. all right, and to respond. Um, so, you know, what's the right level? How far should we go? Should they get aircraft? What should they get? Well, I'd step back and say, first of all, how is Ukraine going to win this conflict? 
What is the pathway? Uh, and maybe there's some alternatives, but let's, let's describe first what it is that we're looking to achieve, and then how do you get there? And what weapons are necessary to get there? I don't know that we've done that. If, I, I hope it's done at, the, at the, the State Department or the Department of Defense, but I haven't seen a, a strategy laid out. And it may be, look, it's not up to us, it's up to the Ukrainians to produce that, but someone's gotta lay out how we get where we wanna get, as opposed to just hoping that the extraordinary resolve of the Ukrainian military and of their people, that that'll be enough. And uh, so I'd like to know, okay, what are you planning on doing? What do you need to get there? And then I can assess which weaponry is necessary in that strategy. Right now, it seems like, you know, I understand the Ukrainian's position, hey, give us everything. <laughs> we want everything. Uh, but, but they're in an extraordinarily disadvantaged uh, position right now because Russia attacks them, sends in missiles, takes out infrastructure, and they can't attack back. Uh, that's a, that's a difficult, maybe like in a boxing match with someone and saying, okay, you can slug this hard you want and I'm just going to defend. It's like kind of hard to win that match. Now, um, the Ukrainians are being invited into the European Union. Um, there is no plan to integrate them into NATO at this point, even though they were extended candidate membership years ago. Uh, do you think, given what we've experienced over the last year, that that position should be changed? I think we're a long way from uh, considering whether uh, Ukraine would be part of NATO. We hope it can remain an independent country, a sovereign country, and kick Russia out. Uh, so let's accomplish that first. But e even if we were able to be successful in doing that, uh, if if putting Ukraine in into NATO were to to cause another conflict and massive loss of life, I don't know that it would be worth it. We're we're uh, for for Ukraine. We'd have to assess whether it's worth it for the rest of us. But uh, we're providing extraordinary support to Ukraine. That ought to continue. Now move to China. As you say, uh, we're not in a military confrontation with China. We are certainly in a heated economic battle with China, which have some national security implications for all sides considered. There's been a lot of focus recently on export controls including advanced semiconductors, on 5G, on Huawei, which now looks to be prepared to really ban Huawei completely from being able to do business with the U.S., maybe with allies as well. A lot of industrial policy being developed there with some allies on board. Is that the correct focus for U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis China right now? Yeah, the answer is yes, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, which is both the Trump administration that really raised the specter of China, I think, to the public awareness. And now the Biden administration has taken it even further. Uh, and, and Secretary Blinken has laid out a strategy for how we're going to deal with, uh, with, uh, with China in, in broad strokes. Uh, he's described that. Uh, which, uh, which, which I think is right. But let's just note that the, the engine that fuels their, their ambition is their economy. And they don't play by the same rules that Western nations play by. Uh, they don't have to, it's not part of their law. So we, for instance, make it illegal to engage in predatory pricing, or we make pre monopolies illegal. They, they don't do those things. And by ex carrying out these kinds of predatory behaviors, they're able to take over major parts of the global economy, make a lot of money, and fuel their military. We've got to make sure that they play by the same rules the rest of us do. We haven't gotten there yet, but there's an effort to do so, uh, and I applaud that effort and think that we and our friends around the world ought to say to China, play by these rules, or you're not going to have the free access to our market and to our products that you've had in the past. So reciprocity is a yeah. kind of a critical yeah. focus here. Yeah. Now, on that issue, we talked a little bit about social media. Of course, U.S. social media companies don't have access in China, not the big ones like Facebook, for example, uh, Instant Twitter. Uh, TikTok is the most popular uh, social media um, in the United States among young people right now. Uh, they're Chinese-owned. Should that be uh, banned because of reciprocity with Chinese? Uh, I, I think that's the kind of question that, that has to be addressed, and my answer would be yes, which is, which is we have to have a reciprocal relationship. If they're going to have their products being sold here, then our products have to be sold there. Uh, and, and with regards to TikTok... I hope you discuss this with your grandkids, by the way. <laughs> well, with TikTok, I mean, one of the questions is, is there the capacity of the Chinese Communist Party uh, to, to be able to spy on American uh, citizens by, uh, by using TikTok? If there is, then we have to prevent it from being used here. We, we have to recognize that we are in a competition with, with China. We want to, if you will, move them from confrontation uh, to a fair competition. But as, if they're going to be engaging in, uh, in malevolent tactics, why, we have to shut them down.
The former Speaker Nancy Pelosi made a trip to Taiwan. Biden didn't really want her to go. She went anyway. Now we hear McCarthy is planning his own trip to Taiwan. A lot of posturing here. Are these things that you'd like to see uh, senior members of U.S. government engaged in, or should they actually be following the administration? You know, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for provocative actions to be taken either by the former speaker or the current speaker. Uh, look, we, we've shown our commitment to, uh, to Taiwan. If there's a reason for a trip in terms of meeting people, why let's just not do it in a way that, that gives, uh, uh, if you will, propaganda fodder to the Chinese Communist Party to, to take action that, that might not be in Taiwan or our interest. Um, so, look, I, you know, I hope to be able to go to Taiwan at some point, but I don't think they'll care very much. So it's like, okay, fine, Romney goes over there, uh, and there'll be others that do as well. Uh, but Well, if he goes Pierre, I think it'll be fine. I think, exactly. Right. The French, the are, way to go, the French yeah. are always welcome. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we just have to be careful not to not to provoke at a time, by the way, where uh, Taiwan is not as, um, uh, if you will, military ready, militarily ready as we might like to see. And frankly, we're not as military uh, militarily ready as we would like to see in the Pacific. Um, our Navy is smaller than it should be. Um, some of our systems are not up to date. Uh, so let's let time pass before we decide to, to you know, to, to poke an angry uh, uh, potential adversary. So four-star general just a few days ago, Mike Minahan, uh, said that he believed that war between the U.S. and China was likely by 2025. Can we just for the record say that's insane? Uh, you know, I don't know that it's insane, but I'm, I'm glad that our military you know, m makes preparations of that nature. Certainly, that's not something we should go out and publish and say, hey, this is what we, th we want to tell the world. But for generals to tell their soldiers, hey, get ready, yeah, of course, get ready. But we don't expect that to happen. I think that's extremely unlikely. It's not in our interest. It's not in China's interest. Um, but uh, uh, being sure that we are militarily so strong that China would never think about um, uh, testing us militarily is the right way to proceed. Okay, one more region for you. Uh, we just saw some drone strikes against Iran. It's become the friend without global limits for Russia. Perhaps Russia had hoped China was going to occupy that position. They're not, but Iran much more of a rogue state. They are fully out of the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, break out nuclear capabilities. They are repressing the young population with enormous violence on a daily basis. And they're also increasingly coordinating ballistic missile support, drone support with the Russians. The Russians are providing them with an air force. What can, what should be done by the United States and its allies to try to contain that threat? Well, as you know, one of the challenges is that we've already got crippling sanctions on Iran. And it hasn't crippled them sufficiently to keep them from building their, you know, military like capacities. Yeah, they've, yeah. Got, they've got a lot of nukes yeah, now. There, there's only so much. There's only so much you can do. I mean, I think. I think. Uh, you know, I, I was raised in a time when what America said, you know, went for the world. I mean, we had the power. Everybody had to had to, you know, uh, bow to what uh, you know we were saying had to be done. That's just not the case anymore. We can't get everything we want. And in this case, we're looking at, at Iran and we say, what resources do we have to make it harder for them to supply the Russians with the weapons they're using in Ukraine uh, and um, uh, to deplete their, you know, their economy? And frankly, they are depleting their economy, as is Russia, as they're carrying out this conflict in Ukraine. And it's being done, by the way, at, at huge cost for them. And I hope Americans recognize that we're battling two very evil forces Iran's force to a certain degree through the supply they're providing to Russia, but Russia's force, and we're doing so without shedding any American blood. It's really quite extraordinary. And uh, it's very much in America's interest for us to stand with the people of Ukraine and to give them the support because we're decimating the Russian military, a, a military which is linked um, from an ally standpoint with, with China, which is a greater long-term threat for us. Uh, and a peaceful, prosperous world is good for America. But history with North Korea um, shows that despite America's best efforts, at least what the U.S. believed were its best efforts, they end up going nuclear and they end up becoming much more of a threat to their neighbors and globally. Um, Iran appears to be on that trajectory right now. Is that where you think we eventually get is we just keep sanctioning them, but ultimately we can't really prevent them from developing nuclear weapons? Um, I don't know that they'll go all the way there. I don't know what military options we will have if they decide to move in that direction uh, and what options uh, Israel has uh, for that matter. But I do believe that China has a more important role than they want to acknowledge, which is even with, with regards to Russia and Ukraine. Um, if we were to turn up the heat on China 
and let them know that as their close friend Russia continues to brutalize uh, a sovereign nation, Ukraine, that there will be consequence for China as well. Not big, bold sanctions, but they're going to be, it's going to be a little harder for some of their products to get in, a little slower for them Say to get that to the Indians too? Uh, Friends of ours, but buying 33 times more oil from the Russians right now. Yeah, so, so th th well, the, uh, the Chinese have a lot more sway with what Vladimir Putin is doing than do the, the Indians. Indians. And, uh, and, and just ha having people recognize that, hey, hey, to a certain degree, if you're aligning with people that are doing very bad things, we notice that. And there will be a consequence for that. Uh, and it's not military consequence, but, but there will be economic consequence, and you probably want to rethink that. Okay, so last question for you. It appears that like having classified documents in your residence is a perk if you're a president or a vice president. Are you sure that if we you know, sort of take a look in your house, you were not going to find uh, any classified documents hanging around? You know, stashed I, any? I, I asked my counsel to go through all of my records, and they found the remains of Jimmy Hoffa. So other than that, uh, I'm, I'm pretty clear. All I can say is I suspect that your garage is larger than Biden's garage. So I'm not sure the garage is any larger, but my, but my cluttered files are enormous. But uh, I have never taken uh, from a government facility a classified document, so I, I don't need to search my files. I, I must admit that the sloppiness, the carelessness that we've seen from this president and from the prior president is really uh, disturbing and, and does not look good on them or on our country. Uh, and is, uh, frankly, uh, of a danger to our national security. Well, you heard it here first. Mitt Romney is not Geraldo Rivera. And we're very <laughs> glad for that. Mitt, great to see Thanks, you. Ian. Thanks, Ian. Good to be with you. That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Do you like what you heard? Of course you did. Well, why don't you check us out at gzeromedia.com and take a moment to sign up for our newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. G Zero World would also like to share a message from our friends at Foreign Policy. Something's often missing in the way we talk about the climate crisis, and that's the issue of justice and equity. On Season 3 of Heat of the Moment, a podcast from Foreign Policy in partnership with the Climate Investment Funds, host John D. Sutter explores the concept of a just transition away from fossil fuels and, hopefully, towards a net-zero future. Listen to Season 3 of Heat of the Moment, a just transition, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.